Father, we thank you. You are God. You are our help. You are all in all. And as we come now to look to your word, I give myself spirit, soul, and body to the action of your spirit. Father, I pray that you would open our hearts and minds that we might receive and that in all places we might be doers of your word and not hearers only. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'll open your Bibles to the book of Exodus, chapter 3. I want to share with you this morning three passages from the scripture that to me, are three of the most powerful things that have ever been said or spoken. I'm not saying they are the most, but I said to me they are three of the most. The first one is in the book of Exodus chapter 3, is God calling Moses to, to deliver his people from Egypt, beginning at verse 10. The scripture says, Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said to God, Who am I, that I should go to Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And God said, Certainly, I will be with you. And this will be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought forth the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God upon this mountain. And Moses said to God, Behold, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them that God, your fa- that God of your fathers has sent me to you, they shall say to me, What is his name? And what shall I say to them? What is his name? Here you have the children of Israel, the sons of the sons and daughters of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Israel. And they, some 400 years after Abraham, are wondering what is his name? Well, they've been in bondage to Egypt for two, over 200 years now. And much of the stuff that they possibly knew before about God, they'd forgotten. So they want to know what is our God's name. In Egypt, Egypt had over 21 gods. And each one had a name. And that name would denote whatever their position or their authority or their character, it would tell that about them. So each one had a different thing. You know, one might have been the God of the sun, another God of provision, another God of love. And yet each one had their own thing. So they want to know of of their God, what is his name? What is his position? What is his authority? And in verse 14, And God said to Moses, I am what I am. (laughs) And I know when we hear that, and I know even when I've seen the Ten Commandments and all, you have it where God says, I am that I am. But no, this is only spoken in a strong, emphatic way. When it is said, it is said that way, strong. In fact, God says, I am what I am. Don't try to put me in a box. I am not just a God over one thing. I am. I exist because I exist. I don't have to have a reason For being, I am because I am. And I become whatever I need to be. 
So then, he said, say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Yeah, that might not hit you all like it does me. But he's declaring whatever you need him to be, he is that. He's not limited where you got to go to him for one thing and then another God for something else. Or another. No, I am whatever you need me to be. I am that. And there is nothing or no one else to compare me to or to compare to me. I am, I always was, I always will be. I don't need anything or anybody to exist or to justify my existence. I am. In chapter 6, same book, verse 2, And God said, spoke to Moses and said to him, I am Yahweh. In the Hebrew, those are the letters Y-H-W-H. And we believe it is pronounced Yahweh. He said, and I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob by the name God Almighty. But by my name Yahweh, or Jehovah, is the transliteration that we have, I was not known to them. They knew me as the almighty God, God that could do anything. But by my name, Yahweh, I am the existing one, the eternal God. They didn't know me that way. They knew that I was powerful. They knew that I was mighty, but they didn't know that I was eternal, always have been, am now, always will be. That is who I am. And when you want to tell them, people about me, he said, that is who you tell. Verse 4, and I have established my covenant with them to give the, them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, wherein they were strangers. So that is one of the passages that really stirs me about my God, the God that I serve. He is, I am. Whatever I need him to be, I can call on him as that, and he is that for me. Jesus had a habit of saying things that upset people of his day. In the book of John, chapter 8. And I know with some, there's a problem, a struggle with the fact of Jesus actually being God. I'm sorry for those that struggle with that. I don't. Matthew 8, 8. I'm sorry, John. Thank you. John chapter 8, as there was a discussion going on between Jesus, Pharisees, verse 56, Jesus said to them, he said, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. So Jesus is saying that Abraham actually saw his coming and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, you're not yet 50 years old. How have you seen Abraham? Then Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, 
I am. <laughs> I existed before Abraham even came into being. He declares that which God declared, I am. And oh, when they heard that, oh my goodness, they were very upset and they wanted to stone him. How dare you declare, I am? That's reserved for God. Well, they didn't know, but it was God speaking. God manifested in human form. And he didn't stop there with it in chapter 18. Remember when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, Judas came with the soldiers, they were coming to arrest him and to take him to the priest and all. <laughs> Scripture says, beginning at verse 4, Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said to them, who do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am. I know in most of your Bibles it says, he said, I am he. But in every translation that I look at, that he is italicized. So that means it was not in the original writing. Jesus did not say, I am he. He said, they, he said who are you looking for? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. He said, I am. And as soon as he had said that to them, as soon as he had said to them, I am, the scripture says they went backward and fell to the ground. <laughs> Who are you looking for? Jesus. I am. And they are all the soldiers just fell because he declared, I am. Not, they not them not realizing, but declaring that he was God. Not just that I am Jesus right now. No, I have, am, I have always been, and always will be. The power that is in that declaration, I am. And you need to understand something, too. That is reserved for God. Years ago when I was working with General Motors, there was a young man there that was working there also that I think he was the one that they invented the word narcissist for. I had never known anyone as egotistic as this man. Everything was about him. Well, he ended up being fired. About a couple of years later, I was talking to another guy that knew him. And somehow the subject of him came up. And I said, yeah, I wonder what he's doing right now. And the guy said, oh, you didn't know? He's dead. I said, no, I didn't know that. What, what happened to him? He said, oh, and he told me about He said he and he told me about this other friend of his. He said they were out on a boat. He and they and their girlfriends were out on a boat. And he went to the back of the boat and just stood there and looked out, and with his hands in the air, he shouted, here I am. And it said, and immediately a lightning bolt came and struck him and killed him right there on the spot. That is reserved for God. Okay, I am is reserved in that sense is reserved for God, okay? See, because you can be for right now, <laughs> and if you get too exalted about that, then you could end up not being anymore. 
So that is the first one. I am. Second one, John chapter 11. When Jesus' friend Lazarus was sick, he got word that Lazarus was sick. And in verse 4, Jesus, when he heard that, he said, The sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified by it. He said that the purpose of this sickness is not death, but that God might be glorified. Then in verse 11, a couple of days later, these, it says in verse 11, these things he said, and after that he said to his disciples, our friend Lazarus is asleep, but I'm going that I might wake him out of his sleep. And then his disciples said, Lord, if he's asleep, he will get well. Howbeit Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he spoke of resting in sleep. So Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there to the end that you may believe. Nevertheless, let's go to him. Jesus told them that he hadn't heard anything else back, but he just came and told them Lazarus died. And I'm glad I wasn't there because now you are really going to see the glory of God. So let's go. When they got there, they got there two days later. And then, uh, let me see where we want to go. Verse 20, then Martha, as soon as she had heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary sat still at the house. Then Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, whatever you ask of God, God will give it to you. Jesus said to her, your brother shall rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And you got to understand something. Martha's in mourning. Her brother died. Okay? And you know how it is when we go to someone who has lost someone close to them, and we want to just try to comfort them. We try to think of something to say, well, they're with the Lord. now. We try to think of something to say. I'll just be honest with you about me. I learned a long time ago that when I go to people like that, I don't try to say anything because there's not a whole lot you can say to make a difference. I just sit there and I'll either hug them or I'll just hold their hand. And I've had people tell me many times that meant more to them than everything else that anybody had said to them. Just be there for them. Okay? So, Jesus said, your brother will rise again. And Martha thinks that it's one of those, you know, religious kind of, well, don't worry, you're going to see him again. He's gonna, and she says, I know he will rise again. In the resurrection at the last day, everybody's going to rise again. Then, and Jesus declares, though, Jesus said to her, remember that I am. It's only spoken emphatically. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. You're talking about he was raised, raised up in the resurrection. I am the resurrection. I am the life. He that believes on me, even though he was dead, yet he shall live. And he that lives and believes on me shall never die. Then he asked, do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. That's not what Jesus asked her. He didn't ask, do you believe that I'm the Christ, the Son of God, that you come? He didn't ask that. 
He said, I am the resurrection. I am life. Do you believe that? Yeah, Lord, I believe that you're the Christ. Then she walks off. She goes to get Mary. And when she had, verse 28, when she had said, so she went her way and called Mary, her sister secretly said, the master has come and calls for you. And as soon as she had heard that, she rose quickly and came to him. Now, Jesus was not yet in town, but was in that place where Martha met him. And the Jews which were with her in the house and comforted her when they saw Mary, that she rose hastily and went out. They followed her, saying, she goes to the grave to weep there. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. That sound familiar? Same, exact same thing Martha said. If you had been here, then he wouldn't have died. Why weren't you here? Why didn't you do something? And Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her. He groaned in the spirit and was troubled. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, come and see. Verse 35, Jesus wept. That's the second. Jesus wept. When he saw how Mary was grieving and weeping, and he saw how the Jews that were there with them were weeping and grieving, Jesus wept. You know what that's another way of saying? God cried. Why? Was it because he was so hurt that Lazarus had died and that no, he knew he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. But looking at them, looking at the sorrow, all the grief and all, it was, this is not what I made man for. This is not what I created mankind for. And not only that, with all that I have done, with all that I've said, with all the miracles that I have shown, do they not yet believe that I am even able to handle and to deal with this situation? Jesus cried. You know, sometimes I wonder as he sits at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us, does he still weep? Because how many of us, yes, I believe in Jesus. Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is my Savior and all. And when something happens, Lord, if, God, why don't you do something about it, Lord? If you had been there, why didn't you do? If. If you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Does Jesus still weep? Because we, when things happen with us, rather than believing, he is in control. And he can fix whatever the problem is. Do we still stand with the if? And the final one, chapter 19. It's real quiet, I guess. To hope that means you all are thinking about it. Jesus now is hanging on the cross.
And after he has told John to take care of his mother. Verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, he said, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it on hyssop and put it to his mouth. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. That's the third one. It is finished. And Jesus died. It is finished. What is finished? Was it everything all over? No. In fact, to see what actually is finished, let's go back to chapter 15. Sorry, make that 17, chapter 17. Jesus here in praying his last prayer. These words Jesus spoke and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may also glorify you. As you have given him power over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is life eternal that they may know that you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you gave me to do. That which God sent him to do on this side was done. No more miracles. No more preaching. No more signs. He had finished. So when he went to the cross and hung there until finally he knew this was it, he said, it is finished. And hung his head and died. For the son part of the I am, it is finished. But the thing about it, what he was sent here for was not over. It was just that which was on this side that was over. The rest was just about to begin. When he went to that Garden of Gethsemane, he got down on his knees and he prayed until the sweat rolled down like blood, saying, Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. If there's any other way we can do this. But nevertheless, not what I want, but what you want. Jesus was not afraid of dying. He was not afraid of the cross. He was not afraid of any of that. But he knew something that was going to be on the other side. What is the wages of sin? What is death in the sense of dying in sin? Being separated from God. For how long? Jesus has taken all the sin of all mankind for all time upon himself. So when he dies, he's got to pay the penalty. He had to go to hell and suffer what you were supposed to suffer and what I was supposed to suffer. And that was not for three days and three nights. That was for eternity. Now, I'm not the I am. 
So I can't fully explain this to you. When we get on the other side, maybe we will understand it. But some kind of way, some way, God condensed that eternity of suffering and separation from God to where Jesus endured all of that during that time that he was in hell. Just knowing that makes me never want to sin again. The price that he had to pay for me That, that whole eternity of, that I was supposed to suffer, somehow he already suffered it for me. It makes me hate everything that I had ever do, have ever done that was sinful, and it makes me never want to sin again. Wish I could say that I never will, but I never want to. So these three passages, <clears throat> I am, Jesus wept, and it is finished. Three of the most powerful passages in the scripture to me. And what about you here this morning? <clears throat> Who is God to you? What do you need him to be? Do you need healing this morning? Well, not only is it that he is the healer, but he is healing. Do you need provision this morning? Well, not only is he the provider, but he is provision. Do you need deliverance? Not only is he the deliverer, but he is deliverance. Do you need comfort? Not only is he the comforter, he is comfort. Do you need strength? Not only is he the strengthener, he is strength. Whatever you need him to be, he is. So if you need him this morning, for anything in your life, I challenge you to get up out of your seat and just come and kneel down before him. And let him know whatever it is that you need him to be. Let him know that, Lord, I believe you are.